Hello and welcome to another regular episode of the Ancient Warfare Magazine podcast. Uh, Ancient Warfare issue 14.1 is out, so we're going to discuss it today. The topic of the issue is um, a war in Hellenistic Asia Minor, so that's what we're discussing today. Uh, we have a few questions to go on, and I'm, I'm sure stuff will come up uh, in the meantime to keep us busy um, and our tongues wagging. Uh, but let's start off with one of the questions that uh, came in from Patreon. The first one is from Brian, who asks, um, to what degree did Mithridates' family dynasty, or so the dynasty of the Mithridates, presumably the sixth, manage to balance between the various former Alexandrian generals with um, both his military powers and, um, and sort of keeping the relationships going? Um, Murray, I think you've looked into that a bit. I like have to, a little uh, bit. Um, so, so you've got the I think it, it raises some other issues with uh, Asia Minor in general, which is that you've got, um, so Mithridates uh, of Chios is the satrap of Phrygia. Um, he maintains that under Alexander's rule. Uh, and then in 281, uh, whilst the successors are fighting with one another uh, for control of uh, Asia Minor, which is essentially the, the, the highway between mainland Greece and the interior of the former Persian Empire into Syria um, and uh, what, the, what is now Iraq and Iran, um, basically is able to say, well, we're going to break away uh, and form our own kingdom in 281. They form their own kingdom in northern Cappadocia and uh, Paphlagonia. Uh, and because the others are distracted, they essentially are able to maintain that kingdom um, without too much trouble. They have to ally with the Galatians, um, of course, who are dealt with in the issue. Um, this sort of series of uh, Gallic uh, warring bands who end up settling uh, in, in Galatia um, after they've invaded the, the former Macedonian Empire in the early third century. Um, and then they basically fight a few wars against the Ptolemies and some other uh, successor imperialistic uh, intentions and are able to maintain their kingdom um, all the way through until you get to Mithridates the sixth, uh, known as the Great and also the Poison King, um, and he's the one who finally comes into contact with Rome, um, and his empire is sort of absorbed into the Roman Empire. Even though there are uh, kings who continue after him, it's pretty much a, a, a dead duck by by the sixties BC. Um, so it's an interesting one because they do indeed maintain the Pontic Empire for. Uh, you know, 200 years under the, um, the Seleucid and and other successors who are warring over Asia Minor. But because they're to the north and on the coast of the Black Sea, um, it's like they are the next step that because they're continuously fighting with one another, they actually never get around to sort of reconquering the, what, what becomes Pontus. Um, so it's an interesting one in that, that idea that the the highway through Asia Minor, which essentially runs down the coast um, that Alexander uh, marched, so down via Halicarnassus and uh, along the coast till you get to the Cilician Gates, um, and then down into into the former uh, centre of the Persian Empire. So, because they're on the the periphery of that important highway area of of Asia Minor, uh, they don't really have to balance. Um, anything that they they absolutely they get uh, some attempts to conquer them, but it's not um, it's not a concerted concerted effort, and it certainly isn't a continuous period of warfare. Uh, and there are I mean there are other opportunistic kingdoms obviously in in Asia Minor like Pergamum um, that that come about, and even the Galatians really that come about because of that distraction um, of the, the the successor states fighting it out with one another. That they are actually able to carve out their own little income, uh, income, um, own little kingdom um, in that area. Thank you. Anybody <laughs> want to add anything to that? <laughs> it's a nice little mess, I think. Is the sort of the the best way you can put it, actually, in terms of if you think about from the point of Alexander invading the Persian Empire, the Persian Empire have got a fairly good hold over uh, Asia Minor. And then you get Alexander arriving 
and at which point his uh, conflict starts, of course, with the Battle of Granicus up in the north of the, I'll, I'll call it the peninsula there, if you like, Asia Minor, if you look at it. Uh, and then, of course, that sort of leads to a defeat of the local satraps. But actually, the defeat is not probably not a comprehensive one of their forces, uh, possibly only you know, mainly their cavalry getting involved in that battle, along with some mercenaries. So subsequently, when Alexander moves on, he does leave uh, Antigonus there as a, a satrap, along with two or three others. But Antigonus ends up becoming the major player in that area and he ends up actually having to fight a rear guard action for Alexander as Alexander moves down the coast and continues his conquests of the cities uh, and polis down the coast and a lot of those end up in, in siege work. Um, Antigonus is in the background actually having to fight a resurgent Persian uh, uh, attack on the supply lines of Alexander. But of course what that then leads to is that actually it's mostly the coastline of or western coastline of Asia Minor that is conquered by Antigonus and his fellow satraps. And the interior uh, more continues to be under the control, under the sway and influence of people like what I just mentioned in terms of the Mithridates uh, kind of uh, previous Persian satraps who may manage to hang on to their positions. Um, another one is Ariarathes down in Cappadocia, who manages to conti continue his control over Cappadocia throughout Alexander's reign, <coughs> and even into the successor period, when, of course, Eumenes is actually put in charge, of, you know, nominally, of Cappadocia, and, of course, Perdiccas has to go and fight against Ariarathes to actually enforce Eumenes' uh, control over the, or over the area. But then even as you sort of move on through the success period, it is more Asia Minor continues to be a place where the Persian aristocracy, if you like, can make, continue to make these resurgent efforts. And eventually it's more that Persian element that maintains the dynasties that then emerge later on, like Mithridates. Uh, I think also Bithynia under um, Nicomedes is uh, also another one of these uh, you know, dinners that sort of pop up, um, just like Pokemon, etc. They are yeah. more more backed by local insurgents rather than the Macedonian factions. And the Macedonian, you know, Seleucids, the Ptolemies, they're so focused on their uh, wars between themselves and the conquests of Central Asia and Egypt and also the coastal regions of the Levant coastline that Asia Minor becomes a sort of a, a middle ground. People start focusing more on Greece and Macedon as mm. a separate entity and the action sort of split between the two centres of the later successor period. So subsequently, it's it, it continues to be that mess of uh, <coughs> middle kingdoms, which eventually, of course, Mithridates VI takes great advantage of. And even in the Roman, as the Romans get involved in that area, they're still not totally um, you know, uh, committed to it as such until they really have to be. So mm. It's a go. complete mess, that's for sure. That's one thing we um, we discovered when making the issue. Um, <laughs> it'll making be the issue hard. Is hard. <laughs> that, would have saved, that would have saved so many thousands of words of writing. It's a complete mess. Oh, it's just a complete mess. Well, you know, the, the maps, which are, of course, kind of not very handy, um, when you're listening to a podcast to say, oh, look at the map. If you have the magazine, certainly refer to the maps um, because they show how many battles took place in that area um, over a fairly short period of time, um, which kind of nicely takes us in to the next question from uh, Patreon. Uh, from Scott, he asks, how well known are the locations of the battles in Asia Minor during this period? Can we do much better than descriptions like near the Dardanelles? Well, simple well, answer is uh, no. I yeah, think we've, I think got, we've some... got rough ideas, but yeah. yeah. Sorry, Murray. Well, magnesia. Mag no, I, th oh, I was about to say the same thing. But I think magnesia is one where it's like, well, it's a it's a contained area, um, and there are others where, yeah, we have a general idea. But again, um, as often happens, a, a scholar will come along with a theory on the exact location of a battle. 
based on walking the field or, or on a new interpretation of <coughs> the ge geographical evidence. Um, and that will convince some people, but then someone will restate the opinion from 1901. Um, but that, in many cases, is the way for a lot of battlefields. You know, I think the yeah, one of the advantages of main one of the advantages of mainland Greece, of course, is that there are so few battlefields um, that that in fact, you know, Marathon has to be fought at Marathon. Thermopylae, all the Thermopylae have to be fought at Thermopylae. Uh, but the, even you know, when you look at um, the battles in the Argolid or the battles in in Boeotia, they're all in a very, very small area. Um, whereas the battles in in uh, Asia Minor, it's much more suited to battlegrounds, and therefore, if it's called uh, you know a battle named after a town, uh, there's actually a much larger span of of ground where the battle could have been fought. Um, and um, and as you say, there are there are so many of them, um, and there's been so much subsequent history. It's very hard to say definitively that this is the battle fought in this you know year in the in the hellenistic period as opposed to earlier or indeed later um so it's it's tricky and i don't think there's much battlefield archaeology that goes on in in asia minor itself you've also got a bit of a problem in terms of the topology and a lot of these battles like if you go with alexander's major battles the granicus and you go with Issus, they are fought on rivers uh rivers change their course of course they change in terms of the, the nature of it when you get these great descriptions like of, of Kirchus saying that you know there's a there's a great sort of cliff edge on one side of the bank um whether that's mm. around 2000 3000 years yeah. later yeah. um that's another problem so of course you might be able to say like this is the river where on that river or whether the, the river has changed mm. course uh, is another thing um, also, of course, we also run to our problems with the sources because you have, as you know, one battle that takes place, which is um, in terms of the successor period of Craterus and Neoptolemus. You know, a very important battle for Craterus because he dies in it um, against Eumenes. Of course, it's not given a location at all. There's no description of the battlefield. It's basically they arrive in Asia Minor, they come down across the Hellespont. And somewhere in Asia Minor, they separate from Antipater <laughs> and they go against Eumenes, who's, who was in charge of Cappadocia, but we're told who was moving up through Asia Minor somewhere at the time. So who knows? It happened in 320 BC, and that's about, and even the date is a little bit somewhere in summer. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, uh, so, yeah. That's why ancient it's, it's, it's also one of the highlights. <laughs> Exactly. Well, it's also one of those highlights about what what's important about a battle to us. It's you know the mm. the narrative of the battle itself is what we want. We want you know exact troop dispositions and movements, and so often the, the sources don't provide that because that wasn't really that wasn't the interesting thing for for, no. for the ancient reader. Um, mm. It's 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 fascinating in that sense. The and then you get a historian, now. you know. It'll, well, I think that's the other thing with Asia Minor and just talking about those small breakaway kingdoms is because we focus and had been in the past focused mainly on, you know, the, the, the large successor empires fighting it out. Um, and because it is that Western coastal route that, um, that Alexander took, that's, that's remains the, the major player. You do get the Athelids, you do get the Galatians, you do get, you know, the kingdoms of Pontus and Colchis and, and, and Cappadocia, Kind of breaking away and, and getting some autonomy because they're not mm. major players and they're not the important part of it and you you get fragments of Auburn and at the same time this was happening and at the same time this was happening and so you know when we start to go oh the kingdom of pontus um you suddenly get well we think he must have been in power by this time and lost power by this time we think um so again we we, we don't have a sort of a certain a certain history we've got we've got fragments that we've got to piece together um in terms of a succession and a, and a history of these these places which tend to, to not write their own history or it certainly hasn't survived also they're not greek that should be the main <laughs> underlying feature you know you've, you've got <laughs> you know, you've got authors who come up come from you know halicarnassus uh, you know on the mm. edge of this you know asia minor world and yet they're you know struggling to sort of say hey we're greek so therefore we're writing about the greek world we're emphasizing the greeks who live on the coastline 
who lives in inland we don't really care they're the mm. others so it's it's yeah. like greek centered perspective yeah yeah there's a hill between us therefore they don't matter mm. yes until they invade us and then we must war with them yeah yes <laughs> Somewhere, or, or they start there. copying our armor, and um, <laughs> then they they're worthy of, you know, some attention. Yeah. So. Yeah, we must we must march our army northwards and fight them somewhere in Asia Minor. So people two thousand years from now will have no idea where we fought. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of fields, I'm sure. Yeah, it's easier with Greece. Um, what about the about the naval um situation? Um, I mean, at least you know where the land ends and the, and the sea begins um can we say anything uh, more uh more well i precise? think uh, um you know abra, abra I think from uh, patreon asks um especially do we know anything about the key naval ports from which to launch warships well i think that uh any city could have been a, a port a useful port for uh a combatant navy in this era. So for example, uh, Antiochus the Great, uh, uh, during his war with the Romans in the 190s, he made Ephesus his main uh, naval base. Uh, and his uh, fleet commander was Polixenitis and several important battles were fought against the Romans. There was uh, Caricus in 191 BC, Myonesus in the next year. Uh, he also had Hannibal as an admiral who was defeated by uh, the Rhodians uh, off the battle of, in the Battle of Sidae in 190 BC. <clears throat> so Ephesus was a, a big city, an important city, and it almost certainly had uh, useful, you know, I'm going to call them port facilities. What's something to keep in mind about uh, this era is that triremes, while it was useful to have a, a facility on the order of what the Athenians had to Piraeus or what may have existed, or I'd say Carthage, for example, in the uh, third century BC, uh, having a big base it was not really uh, necessary uh, in, in order a place to put your fleet because most of these ships could have been uh, hauled out by their own crews out of the water beach. It was done very regu regularly and uh, and, and, and so, and much could have been improvised too. Uh, when it talks about uh, the question uh, from Patreon was, uh, are there key naval ports from which to uh, launch warships on patrol for pirates in Asia Minor? That could have been done from any uh, place and, and was. The interesting thing about piracy in Asia Minor, in fact, piracy uh, all across the Mediterranean was that it, it was extremely common and it typically uh, mushroomed in times of war. So what would happen is, is that when if a war broke out and the combatant fleets were occupied with dealing with each other, they were not devoting time towards hunting down pirates. So piracy itself flourished. Mm -hmm. uh, also, this I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm putting piracy in in air quotes, which you can't see because it's a podcast. But uh, <laughs> uh, pirates are bandits with boats. One of the interesting things about pirates and, and piracy in general is that much of it is in the eye, I think, of the beholder in the sense that uh, some of these pirates may have had official encouragement. Others may have been acting simply out of a profit motive. They were obviously people who had their own uh, ships and took advantage of whatever opportunity <coughs> existed. Uh, so apart from also the you know, problems of what would happen when the rival fleets were uh, dealing with each other and not chasing pirates, not suppressing piracy, uh, was when other uh, states either lost interest or were uh, too restricted in what they could do to suppress piracy. So, for example, uh, when after the Third Macedonian War, Rome was uh, upset with uh, Rhodes and some other allies uh, who had you know, not been as uh, helpful to them, as supportive as they would have wished, uh, they restricted their sizes of their fleets, and these are exactly the fleets that would have been chasing pirates in the latter third century. Uh, sorry, latter uh, first century uh, BC. Second century. Uh, second century, yes, latter second century uh, BC, and that was one of the things that allowed piracy in the latter second century and the early uh, first century BC to uh, 
uh, spiral out of control uh, from all sources that we have. Uh, I mean, maybe they're exaggerated, but it certainly seems that uh, piracy really uh, became a huge problem uh, in this era because the, the the states that would have kept it under control were a little weak and the Romans were not paying attention, were not interested until finally they started paying attention. So uh, getting to Mithridates uh, during his war with the Romans, piracy also flourished because there were many pirates who were taking advantage of the chaos to uh, wreak havoc wherever they were. Interestingly enough, though, mm -hmm. the Romans themselves fueled piracy because uh, since they had such an appetite for slaves and they had actually turned the island of Delos, this is the holy island of Delos, into uh, a slave market where they would be purchasing slaves to be brought to Italy, uh, that just encouraged piracy because these slaves were being taken by the pirates. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Rome, in effect, cr created much of this problem for themselves and piracy itself was not yeah. truly squelched until, well, two things mainly. One was that Pompey in the first century BC received a command for the entire Mediterranean and, and, and quashed the pirates all at once. At least that's how the story goes. But, but really, piracy was brought to an end in a, a significant way, uh, in an important way, only because Rome ended up controlling every inch of the Mediterranean basin so that the pirates themselves didn't have any place to go to fence their stolen goods. Because one of the other things is that a pirate needs a boat to steal, but he also needs a place to go and sell his stolen goods. And if you don't have any place to do that, the economics of piracy do not work. Comprehensive answer. Um, I think a couple of <laughs> points need to be made. Um, uh, first of all, is it's kind of like uh, you were saying, like you can launch ships almost everywhere. Are there any key naval ports? You can almost turn it around. I mean, certainly in the ancient world, a coastal city is going to be a port because there's hardly a point of having a coastal city otherwise. Um, you know, you're going to pick a certainly, um, certainly when it's um, a colony of some city, they're they're going to be looking toward trade and communication. That's going to be overseas. Um, uh, suppressing piracy, hunting, chasing pirates, that's always uh, an interesting one. Um, it's uh, always important to realize that um, the the worst period of piracy, as far as we know, of course, you know, uh, interest of sources and everything, um, is the period when chaos in uh, Asia Minor is at its height. Uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, what is it? first and second quarter of the first century BC when Mithridates is running amok. Uh, there are, I mean, there, uh, the Seleucid Empire is sort of pretty much collapsed. Uh, Pergamon is sort of a Roman Empire, but at the edge. So it's, it's economically, it's a com complete mess. And then there's a constant warfare so that there's more of an incentive for people to go to war or to go to sea and uh, and find some way of uh, of making a living, and um, yeah, you could argue. Okay, when when Rome, you know, century later, Rome has taken over and has basically said, "Okay, everybody, be quiet now, or else." Uh, that works, but it is also uh, um, the Roman Empire also just helps the economy to develop, and people have less of an incentive. So, uh, it, it's certainly in the ancient world, you always have to look at. Um, you know, how far inland uh, is there peace or chaos? And that's an important thing. You know, when Pompey gets his imperium for the entire Mediterranean, he gets it for 50 miles inland everywhere. Hmm. So he can go yeah. for bases and stuff. There's, it, there's, I think there's very little um, like pirate chasing like we might picture in, say, the 18th century, you know, frigates in the Caribbean hmm. playing pirates in the Caribbean. Um, uh, you know, th that's not what triremes, uh, or even try trihemioli are really good at. I mean, if you spot a ship, you can try and catch it, but, uh, otherwise it's hard to do. What's interesting it's, is it to, to, uh, to Mark's point there about, uh, you said pirates are, uh, are bandits on boats, right? Kind of to paraphrase what you said, um, Pompey did what he did with his up to 50 miles inland, 
but they never quite eliminated banditry. Latrocinium continued in different parts of the yeah. and certainly in Asia Minor and Cilicia particularly. Um, and in Italy. <laughs> and, and Italy. It, it's amazing, isn't it? It's, it's, in fact, Tiberius, uh, at one of his jobs was, as, a, as, a, as a teenager in his early position was to kind of deal mm. with those sorts of things. So um, they didn't have access to the sea, but there was always an opportunity yeah. for, a, for a bandit. Well, I think the, well, um, the question here, you know, no offence to our Patreon, but uh, it, I think the question is wrong in terms of saying, is there a key naval port? I think we should be turning it around and saying, is, are there key naval resources available? in these areas and if you think of That's Samos question, yeah. and you think about the the coast of southern Asia Minor you've got huge resources of timber for shipbuilding and of course you know I think a couple, couple of times that especially the Romans try to deal with uh, piracy you, know, you can take away uh, you know strip the pirates of their ships but of course give them money to then you know go out and set start farming that's actually just giving them some cash to go out and mm. you know create, build a new fleet and of <laughs> course it's it's where those resources are that you find those those problems re-emerging time and time again yeah. and also where you find of course the you know going back to the uh, successor period the dynasties um focusing their attention on parts of that coastline uh because there are those resources there to develop uh, <coughs> their naval powers from yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I, as, yeah. as well, where um, the the currents in the, in the Mediterranean make it uh, attractive if you're uh, if you've got anything to trade from, say, Egypt, and you need to go to Greece, you're probably going to sail up the coast of the Levant, and then until you mm -hmm. um, sort of get to Asia Minor, and then you turn west and sail west until you get to um, Greece. If you're going the other way, you can. You know, you can just grab the catch the wind, which almost always comes from the north, and you can cross the Mediterranean um, in a very short amount of time, which you know, uh, without being out of sight of land, which they didn't prefer to do. So, your prey is going to um, come in a very predictable route. Hmm. Hence, why the Ptolemies, of well, the, course, were so interested in those key islands, you know, yeah. Cyprus yeah. and Cos and yeah. whatnot, because they're basically saying if we want to keep in touch with what's happening back in in Greece hmm. and Macedon, then we're going to have to be able to open it and keep open this shipping lane to our our yep. fleet. Have the ship and of course the stepping stone. And when almost and when the mess happens, why Rhodes becomes a pirate center because it's one of those islands with a port that becomes a, a opportunistic opportunity to an opportunistic opportunity. Um, you know, to to take advantage of a, an island with a port that can become autonomous. Uh, and you know they they recruit from. You know, Crete of the hundred cities, so they also become notorious as pirates. Uh, not, not. I don't think any Cretan city becomes a pirate capital, but but crews of, of pirate ships are very often uh, associated with Cretan crew uh, because they're so, uh, according to the sources, Cretan. Um, anyway, but um, you also get that issue of um, not only the, the, the sort of the the, the roots and, and the power. Um, but you've got this amazing, yeah, predictability. And like you were just saying, yes, but this sort of just repeats itself because it's the same route all the way to the Battle of Actium. It's, it's exactly the same. That's This is how it's going to go down. This is where we can meet them. Um, you know, there's always that question of how on earth did you organize to meet with a naval force to fight a battle? How are you even in the same area? How is that possible? And so, well, there's actually very limited places where you can actually meet and so you can always meet them on a certain area of coastline to fight a naval battle well now we drifted um ah, lots of uh, jets uh, uh, ah. like our, like we got rammed and our oars got broken there you go uh that's that's not what you did it's not ramming um what's it called sharing Sharing. Sharing. Oh, sorry. Sharing my naval terminology. Yeah. I'm in New Zealand. I'm making sharing gestures, which is, of course, entirely useless on podcast again. We're really up and at it today. Uh, I'm sorry. It, as, as I told the guys, it's my sixth today. Um, my talking brain is maybe uh, needs a recharge. Murray at least got to sleep. Um, I did. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't know if any other questions came up in the meantime. Uh, on uh, uh, on our live stream, 
I don't know if there's anybody there. It's Adam too Walsh. warm. It's midsummer. Who, who goes and watches Brady. that? No, I think we've covered all those questions. There we go. Oh, indeed. And we've been told no. There are no more questions. Right, there you go. Good, excellent. I think I, Angus can edit that little bit of that pregnant pause out. <laughs> I'm afraid he's going to have to. Uh, let's see. Uh. <laughs> all right, what struck you wondering. about when, when preparing mm. this issue? What, what stood out about this theme? Well, other than the difficulty to illustrate, um, I think <laughs> well, that's the, normal. You'll find right, right, right. Uh, I think the, the the fascinating thing is that a the state of modern scholarship means that that people have moved beyond looking at the the major players, and yet there's still things to say about the major players. Um, you know, there's a there's a, uh, a biography of Demetrius Poliorcetes that's just come out, and it's the first one um, by by um, Pat. Pat Wheatley, um, which is like, that's crazy that, you know, the first biography of Demetrius Poliorcetes comes out in 2020. Um, because he's, you know, everyone knows the name of Demetrius Poliorcetes. And, mm. uh, you know, there's all these major players uh, in, the, in the area. And yet, it, for, for so often, we, there's more we need to know about them and more we can find out about them. And moving beyond the major players, you then have the, the kingdom of Pontus, the, the Galatians, um, who again we you know we've always heard about the Galatians and, and and these sorts of things, but they they actually there's enough material um, as we're finding uh, in in the publishing world now that people can write entire monographs on the history of, of one of these kingdoms and and that there's so much more material out there if you look beyond the, the sort of the main uh, the main narratives and the you know if we're not going to look at the Seleucids. Uh, or, or, you know, one of the major successor kings. There's actually a lot more, um, there's a lot more to, to find out and say, which is fascinating. Because, of course, they all, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. And it's a messy jigsaw puzzle because you can look at one of yeah. these in isolation, the kingdom of Pontus. So you can look at the kingdom of Pontus in isolation. Um, and there are bits that intersect with other kingdoms. But then an idea of giving you a cohesive, history of Asia Minor, for instance, without even thinking about how it interacts with other parts of, of the former Persian or Alexandrian Empire, suddenly creates this very difficult jigsaw puzzle to actually put together because they all intersect and they interact and there are treaties and, you know, the rise of Pergamon, which we sort of uh, looked at in the issue, was so fortunate and opportunistic how it becomes uh, the Attalid Empire. Um, which then, you know, is fortunate that it allies with Rome uh, at a time where, at, you know, allying with Rome wasn't necessarily the the right move, and yet it proves to be the right move um, going forward. So that the the Attalids essentially guarantee their existence and their 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 thriving by allying with Rome when Rome at the end of the Second Punic War, decides to move into, into Asia and into Greece first and then into Asia Minor. So all of that intersecting creates a, an incredibly rich uh, tapestry to, to explore. Um, you know, and we, we, having done an issue on Asia Minor, there's so much more about Asia Minor than you could say. Unfortunately, there's no illustrations that you can put to it, so it, it makes it very difficult. <laughs> but, um, you know, and I think it's also uh, this way Asia Minor's fascinating from a from a the styles of warfare that fight in asia minor so obviously before um alexander's conquest you've got the persian empire which is essentially um you know an archery infantry with cavalry support based army they are defeated by the greeks when xerxes invades then you get uh the macedonian phalanx coming into uh, asia minor to conquer it but of course they've adopted very greek hoplite Esque tactics by that point, um, with all those coastal cities with with uh, Greek, um, you know, Greek populations, so that you've got uh, archaeological records of the the Payava tombs, um, the 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 Nereid monument. Uh, so by the fourth century, they've got sort of Greek hoplite uh, panoply everywhere, and then of course they all adopt the the Macedonian phalanx, and then you have the Roman legions coming in, and then well, the the adoption whether it comes that way or the other, the adoption of Roman 
shield oval shield scutums by uh by greek tactics as a kind of a the theophora and things like that or is it a galatian thing or does it go the other way um and again because the archaeological record doesn't tell us we've got all sorts of rich things to explain you, you know the the original idea was that pyrrhus invades italy sees the roman legionaries and goes well that's a good idea and then brings it back into asia minor um and but within a generation everyone including the ptolemies have oval shielded uh, theophoroi and you're like well that's very fast perhaps it's actually the other way around we don't know um and so all of those sort of unanswered questions uh you've also got the question of whether the uh, in the first place the hoplite pan uh, panoply actually comes from uh, perhaps south uh, southwestern uh, asia minor maybe Ooh, carrier yeah. or whatnot you've got a reference in terms of uh greek uh, sorry um carrier mercenaries going down and fighting mm -hmm. in egypt with equipment that sounds very familiar to a, a later Greek hoplite mm. style. So well, that's, a, that's, an entirely, that's an entirely different issue. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's an issue yeah. in itself. No, that's a, no, 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 yeah. no, I mean, like, yeah, yeah, well, magazine. But, Where did the hoplites yeah. come from? Oh, oh my God, yeah. no. Um, yes, exactly right, exactly right. And I think- I mean, uh, that earlier period as well, it's sort of, again, you're sort of talking about post-Alexander, um, you know, small, small dynasties sort of having a, an extraordinary influence if you look back in terms of even the Akman of persian period you've already got small kingdoms like the Carians, who are you know, they're treated as something separate and special and um, mm -hmm. they're given a sort of semi semi autonomy um but yeah um yeah it's an interesting area but i think it's it's also one of those ideas that it is a highway and it's a highway in both directions you know, very often we concentrate on Greece and we have an orientalizing period in Greek pottery, for instance, and other things. But in fact, there's, a, there's influence both ways. So I think the idea that ideas can travel up this very predictable sea route, you know, that the importance of Cyprus in, in all of that is, is something that, again, there are people who concentrate on Cyprus, but placing Cyprus within the, the wider context of Asia Minor and, you know, Greece and even, even further south and east, um, it's that idea that ideas, technologies, uh, you know, writing can travel um, mm. along these routes. So the idea that, you know, influences on warfare and styles of warfare can become widespread quickly shouldn't surprise us. Um, yeah. And, and, it's, and it's, it's, again, something that's open for debate um, about which comes first and where does it come from, mm. because I think the... The fact is that these things can happen very quickly. So working out who was first with it can often come down to surviving evidence, not necessarily reflecting the reality, but but just sort of giving us a clue that other pieces of evidence contradict. Hmm. You've got that to reference in terms of uh, Pericles as well, when he sort of looks to make Athens the great cultural center. Uh, it, there's the reference, I think, in Thucydides to him looking towards Asia Minor to the Greek cities of, of the Ionian coast and mm. for those you know great great fields of you know everything from poetry to architecture etc cetera, etc cetera, um, that seems to be sort of the already an idea there that they're, mm. they're mm. already looking for that, that area they, they yeah. acknowledge that and I think we get clues in it you know where does Solon go after he's left Athens he goes mm. to Asia Minor where does Themistocles go when he's ostracized from from Athens he goes to Asia Minor where does where does Hannibal go when he's defeated by the Romans he goes to Asia Minor so I think Asia Minor is a is a is a an, an essential um part of the ancient Mediterranean world in general um and it's you know it's it's rich it's diverse uh there's opportunities within it for for you know advancement uh and all sorts you know it's it's a remarkable you know, it, it, this is the, the way you de describe that reminds me it sounds like texas was to the people in the, <laughs> in the <Asian laughs> century. They, they'd lost everything in mississippi and tennessee so they came to texas to reinvent themselves so my, my contribution yeah. there you go there you go in the meantime we've got some more questions coming from our live stream uh, how did control the bus for us translate into control of athenian food um well, who wants to go there well, I can talk about what it was, how important it was in the fifth century, which is is pre-Hellenistic period. But I'll talk about that anyway. 
uh, forget any temporal rules. But I, I think what it is, is, if you're talking about Athens as of the uh, late fifth century, it was hugely important. It was all important, really. Uh, the Athenians' entire war strategy during the Peloponnesian War centered around uh, retaining control of the sea, right? Maintain a big navy, don't go out and fight the uh, Spartans in a big battle. You'll probably lose that. But if you have control of the sea, you can import food from the farms of the Black Sea through the Bosporus and the Hellespont, which is another name for the Dardanelles, and uh, import the food into Athens via Piraeus. And the link to Piraeus, and Piraeus is the port city of Athens, because Athens is actually a few miles inland. Uh, the, the, it's protected by the Long Walls. So effectively with the Long Walls, and given the relatively uh, primitive nature of Greek siegecraft in the fifth century, island. Uh, uh, Athens had effectively made itself into an island. Uh, much like Britain in World Wars I and II, is that it relied on imports from overseas, but it was unassailable really by land. As long as it had the navy, that I'm talking about Athens, as long as the Athens navy was supreme, it didn't have anything to worry about. But of course, ultimately what happened was is that the Spartans developed a powerful enough navy to actually challenge the Athenians for control of the Hellespont and win control of the Hellespont, obviously most famously at uh, the Battle of Aegispotomy in uh, 405 BC, uh, destroyed the last extant Athenian fleet, cut off the food supply, allowed Athens to starve, and then uh, went to Athens, uh, took their surrender, and knocked down the Long Walls. So very important, extremely important to Athens. It's actually one of the reasons why the, the war between the, the Athenians and the Spartans, of course, Peloponnesian War actually commenced because, of course, you've got, uh, stemming from the Persian uh, invasions earlier in the century, uh, you have that development of what starts out as a Hellenic fleet, you know, seeking vengeance from the Persians, develops into a fleet led by the Athenians, the Delian League, and, of course, the Delian League eventually uh, the Athenians that that changes from a, a, a league of allies, uh, albeit you know by the end fairly strained tension allies, um, but eventually it, Athens their hand is forced to really make that into the Athenian Empire because of course it, some of those allies who are crucial to that link to the to the Dardanelles the, the Hellespont in terms of islands like Sestos they start looking to break away from that league. And of course, the Athenians can't let that happen because that would be a break in that chain coming down from the, the Hellespont, down from the Black Sea and interrupting their grain supply, which, of course, they de they depend mm -hmm. upon. So, uh, again, you know, think... that part of that, that reason for the war breaking out is the Athenians recognising they can't let that go. They've got to, whatever it takes, if it mm -hmm. causes a war, so be it but they've got to maintain that sort of that chain. And I think I think it's very interesting because this the, the Black Sea is such a rich region for grain, uh, you know, all the way up into the Crimea. Um, and the Dardanelles is such a narrow channel that controlling it is actually incredibly easy. Um, not not easy in terms of maintaining, but certainly if you can control that very narrow passage of water, you can block uh, the, the passage mm. of grain to, to Athens and then later um, cities that rely on it and I think again you've got so many ports you know as we said before that any coastal city in that entire region of Ionia and the islands in the Aegean can be a port whether it be Lemnos or uh, Samos or uh, you know any you could even make one when you've got that with the with Potidaea and Amphipolis you can you, you can create the port and again the the conflict between uh, Athens and Sparta, you find it igniting over the threat that, uh, you know, Spartan interests in the north can have. And like when when uh, Brasidas goes to Amphipolis uh, in 424, that causes all sorts of issues. Uh, and of course, poor old Athens gets distracted by fighting the Battle of Delium against Thebes. And then the following year is a truce. Um, they have to wait till 422 to actually deal with the fact that there the route and again it's this coastal route um you know amphipolis is on the on the the coast of thrace but because of the the coastal sailing patterns of, of fleets 
it's not like you can bypass that area with your grain ships. You, you've got to go past it. And therefore, having a Spartan base there with a Spartan Navy, you know, again, uh, not, not necessarily a particularly adept Navy, but it's still too much of a threat to your grain supply to allow it to continue. And that's why Cleon goes up to, to try and oust Brasidas uh, from Amphipolis. But it's, 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 again, it comes back to there are certain patterns of, of behavior in terms of shipping that you can predict as a, you know, going around the Aegean coast of Euboea, you don't do that. That's something that, you know, obviously Xerxes didn't realize and lost, was it 400 ships? Um, and so there's, there's such a, a very narrow seaway that is the pathway of all these ships that, uh, in a way, it's not surprising that the battles that we know of took place in the same place again and again and again. Um, it's, it's quite remarkable. The, the crucial strategic importance of the Bosporus, for example, uh, is was such that it makes one wonder why the city of Byzantium took so long to actually come into its own as this great center of power. I mean, it literally sat right on the, 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 the jugular of uh, one of the most important trade routes around, but Byzantium was mm -hmm. not a, a major player at, at any point un, until really uh, many centuries later. And it, I, I, I'm wondering, did it take I, Constantine to recognize that. it? Or? I'd argue against that because the, if you look at it, the Athenians are involved up there so much. One of the things that Philip uh, II of Macedon makes, you know, one of his priorities is taking that control of that area. Uh, there are the Greek world is integrally involved in that area from an early period. Uh, I, I think they do realize that. It's mm. just that maybe it, it's more that that area is controlled by ex, you know, external forces rather than there being an independent, or not independent, but um, a, a you know the power residing in that location. Well, the, the thing is also that there are lots mm. of islands in that part of the world too, and I'm thinking of uh, particularly uh, uh, Lesbos, uh, Amitalini, um, which of course uh, met its match with Athens, didn't it? The famous uh, massacre there. Mm. But um, no, it, it's essentially that there is an island tucked right down the corner, just around uh, the corner of the, I'm looking at here, the, uh, the, the isthmus as it goes up towards uh, the Sea of Mamara. And mm. uh, you know, it, 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 if you have a fleet and you can actually deploy it, you, you, you don't have to be right on top, but you just need to be close by. Mm. Mm. So, Estros? Estros? I think. I'm looking at sure. Samothraki, you've got Limnos, Lesbos, uh, you've got Skiros. Mm. I mean, how many Greek islands can you have? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's there's some with a couple of Turkish <laughs> names I can't even begin to pronounce because they've got strange little squiggles right. on them. So last question is <laughs> not really related to uh, warfare and Hellenistic Asian Minor, but it came in, So, and we're talking about the area. Uh, during the Greco-Persian Wars, when the Greeks of Asia Minor were maintaining the wooden bridge over the Hellespont, were there any army, any defending actions or raids against the bridge <coughs> the defenders had to tackle? Do we know? It depends on which version you go with as to ha whether the bridge stayed in position um, mm. during the, uh, the time that Persian invasion took place. Um, one, I think one take on it is that once the Persian forces had actually crossed uh, from Asia to Europe, then pretty soon after the bridge was dismantled and perhaps the, sh the ships being used, uh, distributed to actually wait uh, for a recall, et cetera. Um, although then that sort of counters with some of the sources referring to um, the Persians bracing back to the bridge after the defeated uh, Salamis. So I, I don't know if we, there does seem to be a, a how can I say if you look at the 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 forces that Dar that um, who am I saying not Darius Xerxes, Xerxes. Um, leaves uh, from Persia with it does the not all of the forces that are mentioned in the first muster of forces over in Persia are then mentioned later on so it sort of suggests that there were defensive forces left in that location to secure the crossing, but whether the actual crossing, the physical crossing of bridge uh, remained, it, it's up in the air. Mm, mm. Which well, I, I guess we'll leave it the... there. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry, Murray. 
Uh, if, we've got the Greg of Persian Wars coming up uh, could, pretty soon, actually. We do. No, I was just going to say it comes back to the resources again that we brought up with uh, the fact that you've got um, shipping and, the, but again, all around the Mediterranean world, the idea that you could rebuild uh, a fleet incredibly quickly um, again is not something we think of today. I, I was discovering that the most common tree type in Greece is in fact the oak, um, and so rebuilding fleets even with, from within Greece, you know, even today there's the, the the oak forest of Foloi in the Peloponnese um, and they're, they're tall straight oak trees uh, ideal for, for building ships uh, in the ancient world um, and so you, you know even if you uh, you were saying about you know taking the ships away from the pirates and giving them farming money they can just be build more ships very very quickly um, and and so again I think that that area even if you did take down a bridge even if it was a pontoon bridge of, of shipping hulks, you can actually build more shipping hulks very quickly to make a bridge again. Um, so it's 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 a very tricky idea, but it's the control of the area that seems to be the important one. And if I could recenter this last question on to the uh, Rome's war with Antiochus the Great uh, concerning the uh, Hellespont, were there any uh, defending actions or raids against the bridge? When the Scipio brothers in 191 BC had taken the their army uh, to the Hellespont and were looking to cross to take the war to Antiochus uh, in Asia Minor, they waited until the Romans had secured and defeated uh, Antiochus's navy uh, until they crossed. So, and it took the battle of first of Caracas, and then. Uh, there was the Battle of Sea Day, and then finally Myonesis, which uh, smashed uh, the power of the Seleucid fleet. So the, the Romans under the Scipio brothers were obviously very worried about being attacked in the Hellespont and having their ships, uh, and their, their troop ships, destroyed. So, uh, get, and, and just getting it back to the question of the Persian and Greek wars, it certainly makes a lot of sense that someone would want to attack a fleet, uh, an army when it was vulnerable in ships and crossing, right? That's a very vulnerable uh, period of time. The Scipio brothers obviously felt that way. Uh, probably the reason why uh, we don't hear about some uh, strike against uh, uh, the Persian Great King's bridge of boats over the Hellespont is that it just was not feasible uh, for the Greeks to even contemplate that uh, uh, during the Greco-Persian Wars. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, as I said, we'll have the Greco-Persian Wars coming up um, in a couple of issues. And in the meantime, yeah. I'd like to say thank you to the whole team, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.